Hi everyone, it's Dave again at the Brass Bench and today is disassembly day. It's the time of year when everybody comes and brings their stuff at the end of the school year, beginning of the summer. The uh, work piles up really quickly and you got a lot of work to take apart before you can do something to it and put it back together. The um, thing about disassembly is very often you're going to have as many problems disassembling as you are assembling your horn or even doing the work. Uh, this is where you find stuff. Uh, could be easy peasy, could be all very difficult. Everything seems to be fine and then suddenly, bam, everything goes wrong. So this is where you find problems. Um, so I've got a lot of work, uh, various different instruments that uh, I can assemble, disassemble, um, and we're going to see just, you know, how everything goes. So uh, as before, I'm using my phone to stream to you, and I'm going to turn the phone over and show the workbench uh, so you won't see me. Um, so I'm not going to be able to see your comments. I am going to look over at my computer uh, and watch for comments for anybody chiming in. So obviously, if you're not yet watching, um, I'm going to be letting the various Facebook brass groups know in a few moments that I am up and live. So just please bear with me as I get everything set up. And uh, pretty soon I'll come back and say the same thing again, talk about what I'm disassembling and why. So bear with me. Of course, my phone's got to ring while I am live streaming with you. Never fails. It just never fails. Okay. There I am, live. Of course, the mandatory coffee. Got to have that. All right, now I'm going to share on some Facebook groups. Uh, first, I'm going to share on my own timeline. Sheraton Horn people. Sheraton trumpets, trumpeters, trumpeting. Who else? Who else am I going to subject this to? Facebook brass, I think. Back at you. So once again, this is Dave at the Brass Bench. Uh, re reiterate what I just said. Uh, today's disassembly day, beginning of the summer, end of the school year. Get a ton of work in, uh, and all this work needs to be disassembled and worked on. Uh, I'm going to be taking apart uh, a few horns in various different ways, and I'm going to be uh, disassembling a trumpet that is super stuck 
and hopefully that won't cause me tons and tons of heartache, but it might. So who knows? You get to see something horrible happen at the brass bench. Uh, I'm going to turn my camera down, uh, point it at the bench. Uh, you'll hear me talking, and you'll see my hands working. So once again, uh, I can't see your comments in my phone, which would be ideal. I can't. So I'm going to be at my computer over here, my laptop, uh, watching for your comments. So if you have any comments, please chime in and ask me questions and so forth and so on. There will be a lag between you typing, me seeing it, and me responding. So there we go. I'm going to turn the camera around. I'm going to turn it over. And I'm going to place it facing down at my workspace. Have another sip of coffee. And there you see the triple horn I am working on. So this horn needs to be disassembled for cleaning and it also needs to have this branch here taken off. This is a Rico Kuhn triple. It is a W393X. And this branch here um, has got some damage to it. And we're replacing it with a new part that Rico has supplied. I, I won't be uh, doing that on air. But you see this part here. It's going to go in. needs to be cut and fit. But this needs to come off. Then the rest of the horn needs to be taken apart for cleaning. I've been told that some of the slides are really stuck. Uh, so first off, we're going to remove the Klebsch strap. When I take horns apart, I use egg cartons uh, to hold the parts. So I'm going to set the parts aside in the egg carton. You see a lot of machining uh, concerns will use egg cartons to hold parts while they're being worked on. Okay, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to, in fact, heat this up and remove this branch. This is going to be the most interesting thing of all. Um, and then I will disassemble the rest of it. There are tons of tubes here to disassemble, obviously. And I will tell you my little secrets for keeping everything straight. There's a lot of stuff going on, but uh, bear with me for a minute. I'm going to go get my velvet shield, which is my heat uh, barrier. And I'm going to get my torch, and we're going to figure out a way to pull this off. I don't want to damage this. I can help it. Uh, but this part is already damaged. It's going to go away. Um, let's try to get it off nice and cleanly. The other considerations are... Uh, these two valves are enormous heat sinks, and we need to uh, get the solder hot enough in here to pull the whole thing off. Then I'm going to disassemble it. It's all going to get cleaned. Uh, before it gets cleaned, though, I'm going to reattach the new branch, and uh, then it will all be cleaned, and then the final finishing, the buffing, polishing, and trying to make it look like it never happened will happen after the ultrasonic cleaning. But we're just doing disassembly today. Bear with me. I'll be right back. Okay, I got my torch. Butane torch. Now my velvet shield. Heat barrier. Looking to see if there's anything horrible going on. I think I'm probably going to want to pull this with some tuning slide pliers. I'll try to pull it straight out. That might work on the finish a little bit. I and mean, we're going to burn the lacquer, but um, if for some reason we want that part intact, 
hopefully that will keep that part intact. So once again, if you have any questions, feel free to comment. I am, um, hi Allison. Yeah, this is a weird looking trumpet. I'm getting to it. I'm getting to a trumpet. It's a student Yamaha. That's coming up. That's just going to be straight disassembly. I'm trying to heat the branch that I'm that we're going to get rid of and use the inducted heat to loosen the solder. You can see the solder starting to beat up there. We're going to let the, the lacquer burn on the branch. Hopefully we can save the lacquer on the ferrules. Ferrules are connecting tubes. Those are the nickel silver tubes. Yeah. Got a little uh, Got a little of the uh, string linkage burning down there. Okay, I can see the solder really starting to liquefy. And I'm now applying some pulling. If you're commenting, I am not looking at what you're doing right now. I'm looking at what I am doing. So Sunday was DC Horn Day at the Catholic University of America that was hosted by Eric Moore, formerly of uh, the U.S. Navy Band. I believe Eric was principal horn with the Navy Band for a lot of years. If Eric is watching, please correct me if I got any of that wrong. Um, Margaret Deichel who's a fellow admin of the Horn People Group, helped with that. Getting the heat on both sides can be very tricky. And like I said, I got a big heat sink in these rotors. So I'm trying to induce the heat from the tube into the ferrule. not having as much success as I had hoped. That's why I decided this assembly would be a really great topic. You never know what's going to happen. Bad things can happen. And usually do. Makes for great television, right? All right, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to not worry about whether or not this feral Get some toasty lacquer. I'm just gonna have to go at these ferrules a bit. I'll have to clean them up later. Because I'm just not getting a lot of movement here. I may have to get some bigger heat too. I was hoping to get this all done with uh, mm -hmm. my butane torch. There we go. Ah, uh, it's mm -hmm. working its way loose. Now it's important to keep the heat just moving evenly between these parts. I find that the better fit parts, the harder it can be to disassemble sometimes. Just a little bit of wiggling can help. It makes a pretty darn good one. Really well fit. going to pop. It's just going to come right out dramatically in a few seconds. Alright, I have decided that I now have to control it a little bit better. And 
and the, the pliers, the tuning slide pliers, are not allowing me to control it as well as I want to, so I'm going to uh, water up a rag so I can grab it and pull. I think that's going to allow me to do what I want to do. If not, I'll go back to the pliers. It's just almost coming loose. Hi, Wendy. Have you ever burned yourself? Yes, Wendy, I have burned myself. I took the hair off of my left arm once completely in a single go. I was working... Uh... Yeah, John, I, that's true. I, I was thinking about removing them. And, and um, honestly, I thought that because this... tube is so long that I might be able to get a lot of heat on it to uh, give me, a, you know, to that it might hold enough heat in itself to allow me to not have to worry about the heat sink that is, that are the rotors, really. Now I need to get some more heat back. It's cooled off too much. I believe Rico's using some, uh, lead-free solder here. It it doesn't melt and flow like uh, 70-30 lead tin does. There we go. There we go. Can I get a yay from the crowd? Thank you Robert Perry Dolan for the go go go. Yes, Jeff Fair, this is a Kuhn triple. <clears throat> uh, why'd he get a sad face, Frank? Come on. Look at this. This is good. This is really good. Not too much toasty lacquer here. I'm going to let it cool off. I have a beautifully removed old branch that I will use as a template for this beautiful new branch supplied by Rico. And that'll all get assembled without the rotors in, because yes, jo uh, John Kowalchuk, you are absolutely right. Those rotors make an enormous heat sink. All right, so I'll have this little bad boy off of there. Set him aside. Let, I'm going to get my velvet shield out of the way, and then we'll talk about disassembling a triple horn for cleaning. All right, so a lot of tubes, and uh, one of the things that we note is that the uh, the um, second F slide is very often extremely similar to the uh, first F alto E flat alto slide, and you can easily get a few of these slides mixed up. So what do you do about that? Well, I've got a little trick that I do which is I remove the double horn slides, the F and the B flat slides, and I keep them separate from all the rest of the slides of the horn. And that way it is very easy for me to know which slides are which. The double horn slides, I always know where they go. The rest of the horn slides, I know where they go. And so if you don't mix up the double horn slides and the rest of the slides, you never have a problem. So I have been told, and it is true, that this horn is extremely stuck. And as such, I'm going to have to use some penetrating oil. Unfortunately, my, uh, my roll of paper towels has disappeared because I don't like... The smell of penetrating oil is nasty. 
So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use my old towel from the bench. I just changed out towels. I like to have a bench with carpet and then a towel on top and then um, I use paper towels to catch things like solder, uh, scrapings, dirt, and whatnot. And so I try to keep a towel just as long as possible. Uh, now this uh, little over here contains a penetrating oil that's distributed by uh, one of the major suppliers. Uh, this is known as Corrosion Cracker. It's an extremely good penetrating oil. Uh, I've also been told that Croil is a really good penetrating oil. I haven't tried Croil yet. So you see, I'm just getting penetrating oil wherever I can. I might have to heat those uh, up to... Uh... Okay, we'll get, we'll get there. I might have to heat those up to draw the penetrating oil down in. Very stinky. You can't smell what I smell right now, which is it's nasty. Um, lots of different ways to pull these slides that are really stuck. These are really stuck. I can use tuning slide pliers. It's very easy to uh, mar stuff with the tuning slide pliers. I, I try not to use them if I can. Uh, instead, I try to use something to drift it. This is a shank arbor. I'm going to stick that right in here. Let me see if you can see that. A little delay. I'm going to look at my laptop to see if I'm getting the image that I want so that you can see what I'm doing. I think so. Anyway, I'm going to use these right in this brace. Yeah, you can see that. And I'm going to tap this. Oh, there we go. Professional. There's a professional at work here. I'm going to tap the slide out. It's going to give me a little bit of leverage right there. All right, now that it's moving, let's see if I can pull it. It's really stuck. This, I think I'm going to use. Ah, it's a little too big. There, I'm going to use a drumstick in the pull knob. Two. Now, the first half, this player keeps it separate in an envelope under the bell flare in the case. Uh, because of the way it hits the case. So that's already pulled. No worries there. Now I can hit at the B flat slides with some penetrating oil. And uh, make sure that this not going to hit any other tube of the horn as I pop that out. There's another one. Let's see. Anybody have any questions? That was better than watching teeth pull. <laughs> well, thanks, Robert. I agree. It's better than having teeth pulled, too. Hang on. Just let me make sure I'm not hitting anything down there. I don't want to scratch or dent anything. It's a beautiful triple horn. Don't want to turn it into a scratch and dent situation if we can help it. I am rather worried that the slide is going to come out and hit the bell ring, so let's protect the bell ring a little bit. Uh, protect slide really from the bell ring is really what I mean to say. Another slide. We'll check to sure that my shank arbor isn't actually going to interfere with the slide below. This particular player is really acidic, I happen to know. Um, and yes, there we go, another one. Okay, now these are the double slides. I'm going to take these 
Right now, I'm going to set them aside. On that egg crate, those are the double slides. Now I'm going to go after every other slide on the horn. Of course, this one's right up in there. That's that's worrisome. Turn this over, and I'm going to... Ah, that'll go in the egg crate. I try really hard to keep uh, all the parts of a horn for a particular player all in the same place so that they don't get lost. But I'm going to be honest with you, what gets lost the most on my bench are pencil clips. If a horn ever comes back from my shop and you don't have your pencil clip, let me know. I've got it somewhere. The W393X is a really clever design. Alto side of the horn can be either F alto or E flat alto. The simple swap of some slides. This is going to be tough. Let's just see if that pulls by finger. Ha! Nope. Of course not. Why would it? Why would it? All right. Now let's. Uh, Tuning slide pliers are tuning slide pliers because they have a set screw and you can set them at various widths so that they don't crush the tubing as you're using them. You just knock the tubes out like that. Sometimes you need to knock it a little bit from each side. Anyway, so this is, uh, I believe this is a standing in E flat alto. I'm going to use this again, the hammer just fits right in there. On that race. See all that red and the green? It's a dead giveaway that there's some corrosion in there holding everything in place. Cementing that tube in place. We're just going to. Gently knock that alto tuning slide out. There you go. Uh, now on this side of the horn, all I have left is this third alto tuning slide. And there's like no room. So this is going to be a real challenge for me. I may have to... Hmm. Here's a brass rod that I have. I'm going to get that in there. I'm going to try that. If I get it started, I should be in luck. Maybe I'll have to get this from the other side. Let's have a look at the other side. It might be easier to do from this side. Yeah, I'll try that. Again, let's protect everything that we can. Hmm. Yeah, it's coming, but slowly. Well, I'm the, the motto keys are frozen. <laughs> oh, there you go. I mean, everything's frozen. I'm gonna take a little break here and look at the comments. See if anybody has any questions. 
Um, Ron. Ron says, I can remove my slides by hand. Lack of maintenance? Yes, yes, Ron. It's it's partially due to lack of maintenance. It's also, but it's mainly due to this guy is has a really acidic body chemistry. It's super easy for his horn to freeze up like in a matter of, of days um, if it just sits there. Um, let's see here. I've tried to remove stuck slides of my own. To varying degrees of success. Yeah, Michael, I, I understand. I understand. So, let's go after a little bit more. Yeah, come on. You can see, probably not. See if I can just pull that by hand yet. Ah, nope. This guy, this guy, I know you might say, well, he's a pro. Well, pros play. You know, that's that's what they do. Uh, getting pros to maintain their instrument is better than getting students to maintain their instrument. People who maintain their instruments the best, in, in my experience, are. Um, the semi-pros, serious amateur, or whatever you want to call them. I, I hope that's not too loud for you guys. I, I don't know what you can hear or what you can't hear. Uh, wow. That is really stuck. This is going to be a heck of a cleaning job. Um, I'm thinking of swapping out my ultrasonic solution with some new stuff, and I have a feeling after I do this and all the other stuff I have in the shop, that I'm going to be swapping it out again. All right, let's turn it over and attack it from this angle, because now I've got plenty of room to work with on this side, and it may even come... Nope. Oh, yeah, it's going to come. There we go. Ta-da! Okay, it's the hardest one of all. And now I have my um, two double horn tuning slides to do. These should should be easy peasy lemon squeezy. Should be. Problem with tuning slide pliers is they can't get in there, so I'm gonna have to do it from this side. You have to be very careful um, that you're not rocking the slide too much. Pulling it out nice and evenly is very important. I'm going to put a little more uh, oil in oil before I go on. And I'm going to have, have a look at comments, see if anybody's got a question that I can answer. Um, more by removing the two slides first. What do you mean by that, Keith? Ask the question a little, a little more specific. Um, let it go. <laughs> it's frozen slides, let it go. That's really good. I was just in Disney, Disney World in Orlando with uh, my older son and his family. They've got a four-year-old daughter, my granddaughter. Uh, and believe me, the song Let It Go is huge. Now I've got room to work on both sides. Now you notice that um, when I did the main tuning slide, I did the su the upper side. And that's because that's almost certainly the side with the most corrosion. That's the one you break it free and it's going to come out. Ah, there we go. That one's ready to just finger pull. Bam! Those are the slides. Let's get those. Happy in an egg crate. Just sitting there. Waiting to be cleaned in a nice gentle spa bath while listening to Mozart. All right, I got to have some more coffee here. Are the rotors frost? I think you mean fr meant frozen, Ken. Yes. More, um... I should have a test that I just surprised as most stuck slides. That, you know, that's something that Ken would do, I think. I think he, isn't he the guy with the, the tests? All right, now, look at them rotors. 
I've got one, two, three, four, five, six lovely rotors to come off of this horn. They're all numbered. That's the good news. That's the good news. I really don't have to worry about um, mixing them up. Except maybe the the uh, maybe the caps. That's number two. And this is um, oh, I forget which number this is. Look at that. Okay, compare that to that. You can see where the wa see how clean that is and how corroded and with the very degrees junk in it. You can see where the um, the water collects while the horn's stored and collects while it's played. I mean, it's all down here and none of it's up here. I had a real good question this weekend at DC Horn Day uh, from Scott Fearing um, about what to do if... Sorry, I'm, I'm looking for the numbers on the rotors. What? To, well, I'm just going to set them aside in order anyway. What to do uh, if? Because I always say empty the water out and then oil it before you put it away, and that's the that's really the best way to um, to maintain your horn. That's that's how you do the most good to maintain your horn when you're not playing, and his question was, well, I empty the water after I'm done playing, after a concert, then I come back the next day and uh, my horn's full of water again. An excellent question. What do I do? Um, the only thing I know to do is to, um, the only thing I know to do is to, um, Store the horn overnight. Sorry, I'm, I'm thinking about positioning where all the parts are in crate. So that I know what's the butt. Uh, it's positioned overnight so that the water runs away from the rotors, collects down in slides, and then you can empty those slides out. Okay. Is this horn from Siberia? It's all frozen. <laughs> uh, I wish. All right, I'm going to take these levers off of the horn before I go any further because those linkages are going to flop around and just cause me all kinds of heartache. I always take the levers off when I clean a horn anyway. <sighs> springs. Oh, gosh, I hate springs. They just like get in the way of everything. Right now, I've got two springs that are like nested inside each other. Okay. The levers are, in fact, numbered. And I should know where they go by the position anyway. So I don't have to worry about them. Store all that together. All right, now that's not going to be in my way. Uh, let's let's do this. Let's take these caps off. While we're here, while I'm in the neighborhood, I'll remove your valve caps. Okay, turn this over. And I'm going to remove one, two, and three first. Then I'm going to do the change rotors. So first, loosen the screws. So again, you know, a lot of this is body chemistry. I mean, I, I I know this guy. He maintains his horn. He's just got a body chemistry that is not conducive to um. I forgot to do this one. More, more, more. Uh, that that is not conducive to uh keeping the horn nice and unfrozen. I guess is probably a good way to put it. I don't know. Some players like play, 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 play. They bring their horns in, 
year or so, and they're just like hardly dirty. There's nothing frozen. There's no deposits. And then other players, same amount of playing, same amount of maintenance, and they come in and their horns are just completely gummed up. And, and these are even players who brush their teeth before they play and everything. And I am convinced after years and years of doing this that it's mainly personal body chemistry. All right, so valve caps are off. The uh, screws are off. Now I'm gonna start removing rotors. This is what's known as a drift. It is a part, a tool that's used to move another part. I'm gonna drift these rotors out through the stop armature. Hit it this way, the bearing plate will fall out. The rotor will fall out. There's the stop armature, number three. Push that out. I take them out, ah, now let's have a look at this. This is the alto side of the horn. And that's where everything's just sitting there. Just sitting, sitting, sitting. All the water's just sitting there. Um, my guess is it's more on the F side, so on the B flat side, and less on the alto side. So let's take out the number two. I like to take the rotors, same thing here. You can see, same thing going on. I like to take the rotors out um, one at a time. Uh, if you drift all three out at once, then the rotor can slam into the, the, ro the rotors of, uh, that have already been drifted out and they're just like hanging loose but not out of the horn, can slam around and hit the bearing plate and cause divots and burrs and stupid stuff like that. So we don't want to do that. Um, now we're going to um, undo the string linkages here, and then we're going to drift out those. So let's take off the string linkages. Matter of unscrewing two screws. This horn is almost, almost disassembled. <laughs> yeah, John. Yeah, John. You you know that, right? Reinstalling valve springs. Is, I mean, it it's the easiest way to get yourself cut. If they are, um, if the 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 ends are rolled over like that, they can be easy to manage in some ways and harder in others. And if they're just long and cut, then you can use this tool. The spring ends of the springs go right in there, and then you can leverage it. But if they're short, yeah, then you got these little pointy things that are just ping, 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 and you and etc. Springs are difficult. Up oh, that little bad boy. Uh, hey, who installed these strings? Oh yeah, that would be me. Well, I did a decent job, so there we go. And I will grab my little knee. I use a nice needle spring, blue needle spring uh, from my woodwind repairing days, which I have given up. I've given up repairing woodwinds. Not because I don't like it, or not in my opinion, my humble opinion, because I was any, I wasn't any good at it. I thought it was pretty good, actually. Um, I know there are better woodwind technicians than I, but I felt comfortable doing anything that a student or advanced amateur wanted done. But because of the amount of supplies, I had to stock. And I had just a very few woodwind customers left who came to me regularly. And I was stocking thousands and thousands of dollars worth of pads and other supplies for a, really, a relatively few customers. And you use the same pads over and over and over most of the time because there are just a few sizes that are, are used. But you need all of the pads. 
and I looked at that pad stock and the supply of all those little parts and I said to myself uh, this is crazy I really really don't need to be stocking all this stuff all right I'm gonna drift this one out that's going to um, I'm worried that's gonna bang do this tube here after I drift that out so I'm going to put something in here to prevent that from happening Wow that one stuck ladies and gentlemen really stuck okay well then let's work on something else in the meantime nice double stack change valve for the double horn bearing plate fell out first set that aside single rotor and we have only one rotor left. The bearing plate has fallen out, but the rotor itself is stuck like a mug in in the stop armature. second I reorganized my bench a little bit this morning now I don't know where anything is mm -hmm. all right now after you have something that's this difficult I have a lot of worries and I'll explain that in a minute well, well, I'll explain it right now, all that benching what cooks in there. Um, when the stop armature, when it slams down, this here is known as the uh, bottom bushing. Sometimes, mm -hmm. some people call it the bottom spindle bearing. Uh, some people refer to the long shaft down here as the bottom spindle bearing. This is the bearing. This is the bushing. When that slams down in and a stop armature hits it because you can't get it out easily, then one of the things that happens is this end, which is tapered like this, can push in like that. It's a very simple fix for that, which is to take that self same um, shank arbor, which has a taper like this and stick it into the now swedged in bushing like this and there are two they're reverse tapers and so you're only going to sweat you burnish that in burnish 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 and that's going to push that out just at the edge got plenty of bearing even if you accidentally over burnish it you're not hurting it because you've got plenty mm -hmm. Of bearing left down there. All right, I'm looking at uh, looking at the comments. Don't see anything new. If you have any comments, any questions, I try to look at the comments while you're commenting. I am going to try now to drift this thing out. And there it goes. Ta da! And there we have it. the final parts. So nothing, I mean, generally, I know these parts so well that I don't get them mixed up. It's easy to figure out which part is which. But that doesn't mean that uh, I can't make mistakes. So I try to, and it doesn't mean that I shouldn't be organized and efficient. I try. And now I'm going to remove the 
uh, court plates or stop plates or um, whatever you want to call them, strike plates. Uh, Yamaha refers to them as strike plates. One thing we suffer from in this industry is a truly universal common dictionary of terminology. I, I think it would be useful for someone to develop a a commonality of a lexicon, a dictionary, so that everybody can know that they're always referring to the same part. Uh, you come to me and say, Dave, my strike plate is not holding the cork, and I would know exactly what you meant my cork stop plate or my bumper plate. Bumper is pretty, you know, generic. Okay, so what we have there is pretty much a disassembled triple horn. The only other thing I want to worry about, I think, is this Amato water key. It is stuck. I'm not even sure this is an Amato brand. It's kind of barrel shaped. really stuck it, it will profit all parts on the inside are removed and wow that really stuck Trading oil in there, and I'm going to drift this piston out. Boop. Just like that. Now, the piston I want to clean uh, along with all these other parts. I'll stick that there. Stick that there. All right, so there we are. Disassembled triple horn, ready for the ultrasonic tank. Let's move on to a new project. Um, where did. John wants to know where I got the egg cards. Actually, that's a kind of funny story because you can buy them from uh, machinist supply shops. I know that. And you, you can also buy egg crating from uh, packing supply houses. But where I got mine was from, believe it or not, the local deli, a place called Towson Hot Bagels. There are a couple of local delis. That was one of them. And they were just throwing them away one day. And they were all over the floor and some of the kitchen guys were, were picking them up and getting ready to throw them in the recycle bin. And I said, what are you going to do with those? Oh, we're going to throw them in the recycle bin. I will pay you for them. And the woman behind the counter said, let me ask my boss. And the boss said, don't take any money from him. Give them to him. So I Got a nice stack of them. Okay, let me safely move all this stuff to another bench. Bear with me for a minute. I want to get all this out of harm's way. All right, so Allison Kaiser said that's a funny looking trumpet. Okay, Allison, how about a trumpet? This is gonna be kind of boring in a way for all of you horn people in that it is not a horn. But it presents its own challenges. This is a rank student trumpet, Yamaha student trumpet. Everything is frozen. Pistons are not. So 
first thing you can do, first thing I will do, is remove the pistons. Three, two, one, lift off. Okay. And the reason I want to remove them first is I want to measure them, even though I've got a chart that tells me um, I want to measure them with my, need to put it in inches, with my um, nice uh, digital calipers here. I want to measure 665, 664. I believe these are 664. 664. I got a reason for that, which will become apparent in a minute. So, 664. That's what I thought it was. That's what it is. No. Ha! Those are nice and frozen. Everything's frozen. So, of course, everything's going to get a nice application of penetrating oil. I am going to be a new tuning slice. This is already bent. It's red rotted. Look at all that red rot on there. We've discussed red rot before. This tuning slide has had it. They are going to pay for a new tuning slide. You can see no gap here, gap here. Perfect indication that somebody has stuck something hard in there, tried to push the slide out, bent it. Now this is, is going to be very obstreperous. This is not going to be easy. It's not going to be fun. This trumpet was, was acquired for nothing. Rank student trumpet. And um, it's in the end with the new part and various other tiny things that have to be done to it as well as cleaning. It's going to cost a couple hundred bucks. It's basically at the value of the trumpet. If it was going to cost any more, I would have taken a deposit because a customer could easily abandon an instrument like that. Oh yeah, John. Do you, so John, do you use, uh, what penetrating oil do you use in your work? As I said before, I'm using uh, Faris Corrosion Cracker. You know, I can set these way aside. Those don't need to be around. Yeah, whew, this smells great. I'm going to get this main tuning slide off first. And I'm going to just really get it in there hard, really get it in there hard. Again, this tuning slide is, is trash. We're going to be acquiring a new one for this particular trumpet. So I'm not worried about marring it. It's coming. Yeah, you can see that this side is frozen as it should be because that's the lead pipe. This side is not coming quite so easily. Again, I'm really not caring too much about this tuning slide. It's uh, set that set screw again. I don't really want to crush it, but I, I, I will if I have to. We're going to put it in a tune slide. Bigger hammer. Smaller hammer doesn't work. Get a bigger hammer. Or as Ken Pope calls it, a persuader. There we go. That's working better. Sometimes when you do this to a slide and you have to exert a lot of extra force, sometimes it will loosen up the others and, and make it easier on you. But with an old piece of junk like this, that we're trying to turn into not a piece of junk. It's not likely. can see just how bent it is. You can see all the 
rot. The slides had it. Look, the Yamaha was make the lead powder bass. Look, I don't know. Now I get my, that's my next task because I'm not going to pull one, two, one, two, two, and three until I put a mandrel, a casing mandrel, to keep the casings from being pulled out of round. So you tried automatic trans mission fluid plus acetone. That's one to one, right? Um, inertia transference device. Nerd humor. Tapping that valve cap, giving it glancing blows in the anti-clockwise direction. And freeze it right. Oh, there we go. Ladies and gents, we have our first, oh my, F and G discovery of the day. We have threads that are just bent right in at the bottom. Luckily, that is a fix that does not take a lot of effort. I won't be charging this customer anything extra. Won't be costing me much extra time, but there you go. As I said, you never know what you're going to find. Here, let's get this off of here, too. If I can, which I can't. No surprise there. No surprise there. Let's just screw that back down. I thought it had enough clearance, but, you know, it has just... needs just a hair more clearance. Needs more clearance, Clarence! Okay, let's get the off. Uh, da, da, da. No horrible surprises under that one. There's a mark right there. Wouldn't be surprised if there is a dent inside the casing. Again, easy enough to fix because I have a 664 mandrel. The threads at the bottoms of casings are the weakest part of the casing, if not the whole instrument in a lot of ways. And so getting a dent like that is actually pretty easy to... Ah, there we go. There we go. There it was. Both of them have been dented beautifully. There we go. I, I just knew there was... We call that occult damage because it is hidden. All right, let me find my mandrel, which should be not far away. Should be. And... I should have had it ready to go, and I apologize for that, everybody. There it is. <sighs> okay, boy, I'm getting high on these fumes already. I'm just loving this. I'm going to get that metal right in there. Look at that. Look at that. All right. Huh. All right. Thank you so much for that. Getting these out uh, can be just a super pain in the ass. And what I find is the with these trumpet slides is the leverage can be so bad that you can't in fact pull the casings out around at the ports. Um, so that's why I put the mandrel in, the casing mandrel, so that we don't do that. Don't do that. That's moving a little bit. I need more oil. I, I'm not high enough. Let's do some of that. Yeah, <laughs> you got that right. John, I heard that. Now, I'm just going to apply a little bit of heat. Try not to set myself on fire. Somebody asked earlier if I've ever hurt myself. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. Very many times. Of course, you try to minimize that sort of mishigas. And as I said earlier, once I, I had a flame going and I just, the entire 
hair on my left arm, gone. And you can smell it too. You know when you've hit, hit yourself with flame, you can smell that. All right, I'm gonna try it. Get a little more direct. Unfortunately, there's no place in there where I can really get purchase. That's stuck. That's real stuck. Okay, so, you know, if it's stuck, move on. Get a little more oil in there. Let that oil cook away. Move on. Move on. All right, now. Problem with this is that when I get down in there, it actually is hitting the bell. So I'm going to hold it up a little bit. And then hit my finger. Hooray! You have to match the 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 curvature of the crook exactly. You dent it like that. There. Let's not do that. It's moving just a bit. Okay, let's go on the second. So again. Get some oil in there, let it cook. Now this is, uh, this is a trick that uh, somebody I know what does. He puts it here on the nib. Now the Yamaha nibs are brazed. So actually you, we can do that. Other nibs, I, it's, it, I worry because they're not brazed. So on the second valve. Plus, I'm always worried about... Ah, and there I go. I dented it. Hooray. Now I'm going to have to fix that. Well, you know, sometimes you win. Sometimes you don't. And in that case, I lost badly. So you see, you guys are getting a real good show here. Getting a good mix of Dave having success and Dave just getting his butt kicked hard. That's a chance you take when you do stuff in public, you know? If I'm here all by myself... I can just take care of any nasty things that happen and no one will ever know. But I'm sticking my neck out just for you, just for good television. Well, ladies and gents, so at this point, Dave says, this is not going well. And I, I really knew that it would likely come to this. So um, my strategy at this point is I really do want this to get some more time cooking with the penetrating oil. I'm going to set this aside and go for another project. Now this next project is actually um, one of my current favorites. Because it it is not uh, disassembly. You know, actually I, I need to um, talk to the owner of this and ask him if he wants it cleaned. But the point is not disassembly for cleaning with this next project. The point is we're going to swap out the lead pipe on this. So the disassembly that we're doing is actually going to be unsoldering. This is a Con 28D.
it's had the bell cut very beautifully. I don't know who did that, but I think it's a nice bell cut. And it's had the lead pipe replaced. It may have all been done by Ron Pence. I don't know. Ron, uh, if you're watching or you know if this is your handiwork, let me know. But the owner wants the original lead pipe put back on. So um, this is going to be just, I'm taking this off. So you might say, oh, what's so big about that? Well, what's so big about this is the guy going on here. This horn has been used a lot. And there is, these 8Ds, especially the older ones, so, use so much that very often players will, their thumbs will rub a hole in the bell tail right above the thumb trigger. Happens a lot. And this is a very nice patch that was put on there to cover up that damage. I don't, and that patch, you'll notice, is right below one of the braces I'm going to heat. Will that patch come off? Well, probably not. But I don't want to, I don't want to have to worry about it. I don't want it to move, so I'm going to wire that down. So that it doesn't move when I hit it with heat. <clears throat> Better safe than sorry. So let's wire that down. We just don't want that patch to move. Very simply going to use my O23 black annealed binding wire to hold it firmly in place. And that's weird. It just didn't really hold. It just broke. So now I am going to have to do it again. Sometimes that happens. Move it down a little lower where there's room to get my cars in and try again. Three is. Uh, Easter egg. Chris Cromer says he prefers the term Easter egg. I guess that you mean by that hidden damage that you find on disassembly. That's a good term, Easter egg. I like that term. I don't like Easter eggs, but I like that as in stuff I find, but I like that term Easter egg. Like in video games, it's an Easter egg. One of the problems with binding wire is on a tape tube is that it will always go lower than where you are. So uh, you have to if, if you do it on a tapered tube, you have to try to find a way to keep it from sliding down to the smaller part of the taper. Usually, I wire it so that it's anchored to some kind of a brace. The problem I have here is that I'm trying to take this lead pipe off. And I'm going to take the braces off, too. Why would you take the braces off, Dave? Well, because I'm not sure that this uh, new lead, newer lead pipe is in exactly the same position as the older lead pipe. Ah, Get out of my way here. I think I, I'm, I'm actually, you know, getting time for lunchtime for me. You know, um, I heard a great term that I believe Rick Serafinoff coined, which is stupid hands. After a while, you know, you start to get stupid hands. And I'm getting to that point. Too much penetrating oil. Need to get this off of the. Uh, um, I, I need to get the lead pipe off of the main lead pipe, and then I've got the final down there. So I will essentially heat, 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 heat like that. All right, and I like to hold the lead pipe with my 
round nose pliers up here. And I've got, there's that, there's that, there's that. And then after I get this off, we'll have a look at the, uh, we'll have a look at the uh, original to see how it fits. But I am taking those two small braces off. Now one of the things that um, I like to notice when I'm doing this is I like to see if the lead pipe pings away to be a, uh, a good indication of workmanship. And the, the solder is getting to liquidus and the lead pipe is not pinging away. Therefore, this lead pipe was likely installed with a high degree of workmanship. Which will not aid me in removing it, so I'm just going to remove the whole main brace. If I start working down here with heat, this will go to solidus, and then I won't be able to uh, remove the whole So better to take the whole brace off. Put it back on with the uh, other lead pipe. I'm going to be getting another torch set up. I really like Jacob Medlin's torch set up. He gets a lot of heat and a very nice flame. Okay, there's the main brace. We'll clean that up a little bit. And now I'm going to just put a little bit of up on this. There we go, a little bit of up. I hope you're all enjoying this, waiting for me to fail spectacularly at something. It's already happened once. These braces can come away with the lead pipe, I don't care. I'm just getting the lead pipe up and off the horn here, and then I'm going to go for pushing it this way. Another advantage of a nice um, unlacquered horn is that uh, I'll get some liquidus there. Actually, I'm going to remove the brace if I can, or move it so that it's not attached. pressure pushing away from me one of the X factors and this is um, it's not how tightly fit the lead pipe is right oh well it wasn't so there we go boom da -da 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 -da. <laughs> Thank you, John. Boy, John, you're just going to, like, troll me all afternoon long, right? Did I melt a valve string? These are all beautiful. Those are gorgeous. All right, where's the new lead pipe? Ah, there it is. I say new because it's really the original one. Here it is. And it's going to go in here, like that. And that's that's going to be beautiful. Right? So, uh, the owner wants it in original condition. And I will do my best. Um, whoever did that lead pipe install, kudos. Well done, you. Um, I, it, 
I believe uh, it was Ron Pence. And again, even if it wasn't whoever d actually put the lead pipe on, the other consideration is the old lead pipe has a amount of water key. We're going to be putting a new one on there. Otherwise, it will have a hole in it. So there we go. This is a naked horn. I'm going to get all that solder junk off of there. Uh, other consider you always put the uh, uh, lead pipe on with the main tuning slide so that you don't get any unparalleling of the size stockings. You want to keep those nice there and there. This is, this is really beautiful. Again, whoever did the work on this 28D, kudos. Beautiful work. I'm very impressed. Makes my job beautiful. So there we go. That's all ready to have that lead pipe installed. Move this off the bench. And then the last, let's get back to that Yamaha trumpet. Let's do that. Sorry about the delay, folks. The pause. I'm kind of running out of space here. I had to put that 28D back in its case. Just running out of space. Ah, back to this POS. All right. I need uh, need my paper toweling to catch the more more of this more penetrating oil. Trying to decide if I'm going to use the tuning slide pliers on this or not. I'd rather not, but I might have to. <sighs> Let's. Uh... That's disturbing. Because uh, that that was not, not a problem before. So I don't recall it being a problem. So somehow I've gotten that casing out around, which is exactly what I was trying to prevent. But, you know, that's the way it goes. Well, that's just going to be a pain in the neck. Why is it that the junky instruments like present the biggest problems? They always do. They're always the hardest to fix. They're the hardest to disassemble. They're the hardest to get fixed. They're the hardest to stay fixed. Got a dent here that could be affecting everything. Actually, this instrument I know is has been purchased merely as like a, a marching instrument. The kid is apparently using uh, his father's really nice. Instrument, which I presume is a nice Yamaha or a nice or a rock or a shilky or something like that. And, uh,
and uh, this was not even purchased. I take that back. It wasn't purchased. It was it was acquired for nothing, and it's worth about that. <laughs> But up, um, one. <sighs> now, let's get this one out. Do, 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 do. What'd you call that, John? Inertial force transmitter? <laughs> language? Was that, did I, did I say, oh, my F and G? Was that the language you're talking about, Chris? Probably. Hey, I, I couched it in uh, SFW terms. Am I right? You know, not suitable for work. Any language is suitable for what I do. I like to say that the first thing, the first tool a craftsman needs to put in their toolbox is a finely honed set of curse words. Checking to make sure I'm not doing more damage than I'm trying to fix. Oh, look at that. Did that? Probably. Again, it's all got fixed anyway, so. In fact, I might even just buy a new crook for this. They're deep. No, the whole repair is. The whole repair is going to produce an instrument that is really very junky. Obviously, I'm not taking the same care that I would with a very nice instrument. <sighs> Whew. That was a lot of work. That's really dirty. Really cemented in there. Thank you all for that. Bilingual English and profanity. <laughs> yeah, in, in, in Canada, isn't that like trilingual or quadrilingual? You know, I know a little bit of French. I, I could learn all the French cuss words. That could happen. So, John, you going to give me a job uh, after uh, the election in November so I can come move up there? Come on, John. I need a Patron. You got to be it, man. This is kind of rocking. I need to break the uh, seal down at the bottom here. Am I done? Not helping. Yamaha actually has a tool to grab that little nib and pull that out. Right. I'm not buying a tool for this, for this, uh, you know, this model's been discontinued. There's no point. You know what? I'm going to try an old trick. John, I, I resent the implication that I am an undesirable. All right. This is what we call wicking. It's it's really just a candle wick from a lamp or from an oil lamp. 
Uh, we use it for ragging you um, and a bunch of other stuff. Ragging is a procedure of uh, polishing using finely uh, graded abrasives to put a finishing uh, look on things.